today we head off this series as we deal with the doctrine of the Trinity. We're going to be answering an objection and and we're going to give it a little evidence concerning the doctrine of the Trinity. Stick around. Coming up next. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25. Therefore laying aside falsehood. Speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another for his name's sake. Prescribe truth, we're giving you what the doctor ordered. Jamal Bandy, apologist, the Lord's servant. We undeserve it, but Christ changed our mind frame. In a world full of errors, the only thing the doctor prescribes is truth. All right. Right, welcome back everybody to the Prescribing Truth Podcast right here on YouTube. I'm JB. If this is your first time listening to this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you can be notified when I have new and upcoming content. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast apps, please leave a rating and a review as this helps us out a lot. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we're available on iTunes, um, Google Play, Stitcher Radio. Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, I mean, a little bit of everywhere. Um, but yeah, so please do that. And if you'd like to connect with me, remember you can email me at prescribed.truth at gmail.com or you can call in, leave a voicemail, or we can chop it up depending on the time of the day at 801-980-6333. If you'd like to support the, the podcast uh, financially, please consider partnering with us on Patreon. At patreon.com forward slash prescribed truth. Uh, we have different rewards here uh, for contributions starting at just a dollar. Anything you can afford will help us out a lot, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. So, today we'll be going into our series dealing with the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, so, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna take our time with this. I'm not gonna rush. Um, this is not gonna want uh, to be one of those things where I take 30 minutes. And try to break down everything and give everything. I'm going to take my time. So as we go through these weeks, I'm, I'm going to be answering, uh, I'm be answering different objections and giving different um, evidences for the doctrine of Trinity as we go throughout the scripture. So with that being said, the very first objection that we're going to be dealing with is there is nowhere in the Bible that says that God is a triune being. Hence, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Well, those people who argue that are correct. I mean, you won't look in the Bible in all 66 books and see the word Trinity, nor will you see God describe himself as a triune being as that verbatim statement. But, I would like to counter that argument. Now, I presented this on the comments section uh, last week. Uh, God put that in the comments, and I, I gave him this objection or this uh, counter, and he completely just, like, diverted and, and just, like, hid from the question and tried to say it had nothing to do with what he was talking about. Okay. So, the statement was, just like I read to you this objection, Nowhere in the Bible does it say God is triune. Nowhere in the Bible is the Trinity there. I said, okay. Now, my first pushback to this, and this is a straw man. Why is it a straw man? Because Christians or Trinitarians do not uh, argue that the word Trinity is in the Bible. That is not why we believe in the Trinity. We don't say, hey, the word Trinity is in the Bible. Therefore, I believe it. That's not what we say. And so for you to argue something like that, it's a straw man fallacy. You're arguing something we don't believe. Now, my second pushback to this, those who make this argument find themselves to be terribly inconsistent. And this is how. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. So as the word Bible. Yet, we refer to God's word as the Bible. Why is that? I mean, the scriptures, nowhere in the 66 books does it say my word is called the Bible. But we call God's word 
the Bible. Why is that? Then it's heretical to say Bible or to call his word the Bible. We should just strictly say the scriptures because the Bible says the scriptures. Or we should stick to saying God's word because it says it's, it's his word. But that's not what we do. Matter of fact, you should throw all your Bibles out if they have a cover that says Holy Bible. Because it's not the Bible. It's called the scriptures. The, the second thing is, there's nowhere in the scriptures that God is called omnipresent or, or said to be omnipresent or omniscient or omnipotent. Though these are attributes of God. Like, he is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. But those words aren't in the Bible. Why do we refer to God in those words? I mean, aren't those words true of God's nature? I mean, by nature, he is omniscient, which means all-knowing. By nature, he is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. By his, in his own nature. He is omnipresent I and mean, he's everywhere at the same time. But yet the Bible does not say that God is omniscient, omnipotent, or omnipresent. So by the reasoning that because the word Trinity is not in the Bible, that God can't be a Trinity. Then God can't be omnipotent then, and God can't be omnipresent and God cannot be omniscient. Why? Because the word are not in the Bible. That's the argument that's being made. Now, you can see how inconsistent that is. Because they would not disagree with me that God is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. They would agree with me with that. Even though those words aren't in the Bible. But why do we know and how do we know that God is omnipresent? omniscient and, op and omnipotent because the concept of all those words is laid out throughout scripture throughout scripture we see that God is all knowing he declared the ending from the beginning throughout scripture we see that he's all powerful he is creator of all things come on now I mean we see throughout the scriptures the concept of him being omniscient he knows all things. Man. Uh, oh, omnipresent. I think that's what I, I've got. Yeah, omnipresent. Like, we see through the scriptures. He's everywhere at the same time. And no one can hide from him. He sees everybody. He's dealing with Israel while he's still dealing with the Amorites and anybody else. He's everywhere. So, they wouldn't disagree with that. Though those words aren't in the Bible. But we get those words because of the concept that's laid out through scripture. And men come up with a word to simplify that, to understand God's nature in human terms. And so, yeah, the Trinity or understanding that God's triune nature may not be a word that's found in the Bible. But the concept is definitely in the scriptures. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. Um, so let's look at this. So I'm gonna give a I'm gonna give a brief evidence for plurality in the Godhead. Now, as we go through this series, I want you to bear with me. I've already got some pushback from the first video. That's fine. Keep it coming. Let's dialogue. Here we're gonna look at Genesis 126. And I already know what some of y'all are going to say already. Oh, you're going to talk about Elohim. And all the plurality. And then y'all are going to say, it's a plural of majesty. Okay. That's fine. Let's deal with it. So, go to our trusty Bible app in the East Word. Now, we're going to look at Genesis 126. And we're going to see something interesting.
Oh, uh, okay, twenty six chapter. All right, so Genesis chapter one, scrolling down to verse twenty six. Right, so here we are. And I have the corresponding, this corresponding um, Hebrew to the side here. So now in English it says, "Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness." Now we got to deal with that. We got to. Now we can deal with the fact that God's being referred to by plural intensive or intensive by being um, Elohim here, where Moses could have easily put Eloah or El. These are all words for God, and they're singular. Now, this is why they say, well, this is a plural of majesty, because God is great, and therefore the writer wanted to refer to him in greatness, especially talking about in creation and all these things. But throughout the majority of scripture, he's called Elohim, as far as God. You know, the word for God is Elohim. And there are a couple of places where he's referred to as El. Cool. Eloah is a singular, but it's rarely used in the Hebrew text. And so that's fine. But I'm not going to stick on Elohim today. What I want to deal with is let us make man in our image. Now, I've heard people say, that this us is also a plural majesty. And I've heard people give examples. You know, one example I'm going to deal with today. Uh, but it doesn't fit. Not like this context. But we're going to look at this. The scripture says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, image here. It's Tesla. And you see the rendering here. It's Hebrew. And we find it. So it's 8674. It's right here. Our image. The interesting thing here is this is the word that's there that was sitting right. Uh, it's the same word that was sitting there earlier. What you see this article in the front here and what it's followed by. This is showing us something here in the Hebrew language. This right here is referring to possession. It's why you see where you have my or um, our image made it our image. That's why that's important there. Now. If this is not clear, let's go one deeper. Now, because some people push back on that. Well, that's not clear to say our, you know, that's the word for image there. But those articles in the front of Hebrew words mean something. Uh, during um, Jesus' walk in on the earth, they would have been reading from the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint is the Greek version of the Old Testament. It was around for a few centuries before Jesus was born in the earth. And so uh, the Jews at the time would have been reading from the Septuagint. And if it if this rendering was wrong, everybody would have known it. Um, I want to show you that the writer of Genesis, Moses, as is being credited to him, knew that there was a plurality in the Godhead. Yet only one God. So let's look at that. Let's look at the, um, the Septuagint here. All right. So that's Genesis 1-1. One, one. Verse 26. Okay, now we might see something very interesting here. This was rendered in the Greek. And keep in mind, scribes, Jewish scribes translated this into the Greek. All right. So it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The word for make here, this verb, is interesting. Now, what I've learned is that when you're dealing with um, 
plurality in these languages, the verbs or the correspond the corresponding verbs will also be in singular or plural. Now in Hebrew, image or make a uh, where it says let uh God said let us make man in our image. The word for make there, I'm gonna have to go back so you can see. That's okay. I go back for you. If you see, you won't see that. So you'll see, and God or said God also to to do or make. Here, this is the word. And here it is up here. Now it has an article in the front, but this rendering is singular. So we have a plural in Elohim, but the verb is singular. Okay, so keep that in mind. So the writer of Hebrews, I mean, sorry, the writer of Genesis knew that there's a there's a single God, there's one God that's doing this. Okay, so there's not multiple gods doing this, it's one God doing this. But in the Greek version, which is translated from the Hebrew, going back to what to twenty six. The word for make here. Poyeo. Now this word you see this rendering up here. Okay. Now what you don't see, well what you should see, is you see this V, this is after the word V A A S one P. Now what this means, let me see if you'd be able to see it on your screen. Uh, it won't pop up. I'm sorry. Well, what it says is that it's a verb. That's the V. And it's an aorist tense. Active voice. Subjunctive mood. First person. That's the one. But the P means plural. That's important. So. The translators knew that there's a plurality that's acting on making man in an image. And this image will belong to God, so being our image, after our likeness. That's important. That is so important. Don't sleep on that now. All right, because image here is singular all right yeah so likeness is also singular all right now in the greek Septuagint, there is actually a word for our you see it I, i'm gonna try to Hey, Meteros. Now it's from another Greek word, but it says our or your by a different reading. Our, your, or by a different reading. So it wasn't um, let us make man in your image after your likeness. It's our, because this is God speaking, and He's creator of all things, as scripture teaches. So our is really there. There's a word for my, because this is God speaking. This is not um, a letter being written to another king that some people try to use as an argument or anything. This is God speaking and he's saying, let us make man in our image. The word for make is in the plural tense, first person. What does that mean? If you look up first person plural, you can Google it. Now you can look up in your grammar books. 
what it means basically is saying we. That means God is speaking, acknowledging that there are other persons involved in making man. And not only making man alone, but making man in our image and after our likeness. Mm -hmm. This is important. This is extremely important. So we see here in the Septuagint, Jesus, the apostles, would have been reading from the Greek Septuagint. It's clear looking at Elohim, seeing that it is a plural intensive, even though it has a singular meaning. That just shows that we believe in one God, yet there's a plurality in the one person. I mean, there's uh, one being of God. Here, we see in the Septuagint that the writer knew, the translators knew that there had to be a plurality. Though there's one God, the scriptures plainly said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Singular likeness, singular image. Our is there and it means literally our. Can't you see it here? I ain't taking it away. It's right here. It means our. The word for make in the Greek is in a plural, first person plural, saying we. Man. So they're basically saying we're going to make. So this goes on to say, let us. We're going to make man in our image after our likeness. This is important. So now, some people like to argue because they can't get away from this. They try to say, well, maybe this is a plural majesty. This, you know, we got Elohim being a being of greatness. Maybe we could do this with these 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 pronouns of us and our. Maybe we could do that. And therefore it's a plural majesty as well. And the example that was given, I'm gonna give you the example that I heard. And for on the surface, it on the surface it looks pretty good. Uh Ezra chapter four, uh starting verse eight. So Ezra 4, 8. So we got Rehum, the commander, and Shemshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Now this begins the letter. Verse 9 begins the letter. And so it's giving the intro, all those who are writing, or, or who's um, the letter's coming from. All right. And then so going to verse 10. Uh, finishing up the intro and verse 11 gives us um, the beginning of the letter and it says this is a copy of the letter that they sent and that's and then it says to Artaxerxes the king then it says your servants the men of the province beyond the river send greeting and now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem they are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. All right, so now we see they are addressing this letter to King Artaxerxes, but they are complaining about these men uh, going to Jerusalem and rebuilding these walls and doing these things. Now, the argument is given that the king, in his reply, uses a plural of majesty. And so we're going to look at that. So that will be verse 17 when, when the king gives his answer. So it says, The king sent an answer to Rahum the commander and Shimshai the scribe and the rest of their associates who live in Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river. Greetings. And now, the letter you sent to us has been plainly read before me. Now, this is a stretch, but this is the one he, this person came up with. He said, the us here is a plural of majesty. Why? Because the letter was addressed to Artaxerxes. So why would he say um, that you sent a letter to us? Obviously, they sent a letter to him. So it should have been, well, I, I received the letter that you sent to me. Let's say, for instance, that is true. Let's let this be. Let's say this is 
a plurality here. This would be him saying, I received the letter that you sent to us, and it has been plainly read before me. Another translation says it's been translated and read before him. All right, so the base of this, which shows that this is not the same as what we saw in Genesis 1.26, is that you have God speaking. You have a singular God, one God, speaking and saying, let us make man in our image. You see that first person plural, we, we are making man in our image. And it's God speaking. Here in this in Ezra 4, you see a letter that's being addressed. The king does not refer to himself in the plural. The letter was sent to him, but also to Jerusalem. The, the, because of the people that's, um, that they were addressing, complaining about. So he says, I, I received the letter that you sent to us. And it has been plainly read before me. Now, the person who gave this example for the scripture did not even brush on the fact that he said it's been read before me. Because if the king was using a royal plural or a plural of majesty, then we simply said the letter has been read clear, um, clearly and plainly before us. Meaning that he's claiming to be a more uh, majesty. But that's not what happens. The letter comes to uh, particular people and these people have to translate and so the king can understand and so therefore it was sent to multiple people it wasn't just sent to one person though it was addressed to one person it wasn't just one person who handled it who had to read it and so it was translated and it was translated clearly before the king but in Genesis 126 there is a plural and you can't get around that now, you could try to skip over Elohim all day long, but you can't skip over God saying, not him writing to someone, not somebody writing to him, or not somebody proclaiming about him, but this is God's dialogue, his exact words. And he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And you can't say that these are angels. I heard somebody say, well, he's referring to angels who would take part in maintaining creation. Where does the scripture say that? Nowhere. Uh, but you, but you want to argue that the triune nature of God can't be biblical. Yet you find it to be possibly biblical that angels took part in creating man. Come on. How far are you going to run from the, the truth that God is trying in his nature? But here, I just want to establish that there is a plurality within the Godhead. Within the one being that is God. That eternally existing uh, plurality of persons. Three persons, might I add. Namely, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, as the series continues, we'll definitely get into those persons and deal with each, each one and show proof of deity as well as personhood. But I want to show you without a shadow of a doubt. In Genesis 126, besides the name, or besides God being called Elohim, that let us make man in our image God's own words show that he was speaking to multiple persons. It was not just a one person. It was multiple persons. Yet, one Elohim. <laughs> so, leave your comments. Give your pushback. I'm open to it. Check out what we have more prescribed true. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. And remember, in a world full of errors, the only thing the doctor prescribes is true. Blessings.